Six Flags Darien Lake is often considered to be one of the worst parks in the Six Flags chain. While I think that statement is true, this is still an enjoyable park, and that's especially impressive when you consider this park's ownership has been a game of hot potato over the past two decades. So in this video, I will review Six Flags Darien Lake. This park story began in 1964. Paul Snyder opened a campground adjacent to Darien Lake. More activities were added over the years, but most notable is the amusement park that opened in 1981 named Darien Lake Fun Country. Many of the park's early rides came from Huss, as the German manufacturer used as the U.S. showground. In 1982, the park built Viper, an arrow looping coaster that opened with a record-breaking five inversions. This gained the park national attention, and it caught the eye of fun time. This chain purchased Darien Lake in 1983, and they continued to expand the property. This included amusement rides and the Darien Lake Performing Arts Center. This is a giant concert venue, one of the largest in upstate New York. In 1995, Premier Parks purchased Darien Lake. They began adding coasters annually. Then in 1998, Premier acquired Six Flags. So in 1999, the park was rebranded as Six Flags Darien Lake. This included the introduction of Looney Tunes and DC characters, and most notably, the park got a new headlining attraction in Superman Ride of Steel, which immediately became the tallest and fastest coaster in all of New York. The park continued to see investments, but by the mid-2000s, Six Flags was heading towards bankruptcy. In an attempt to reduce their debt, multiple parks, including Darien Lake, were sold to park management in 2007. Shortly thereafter, the park's name was shortened to just Darien Lake, and all the Six Flags branding was removed. On the bright side, the park still got a healthy dose of new investments. In 2011, Hershend began operating Darien Lake. This chain was most well known for Dollywood and Silver Dollar City. The park was heavily rumored to get an RMC conversion of Predator during this ownership named Lake Monster, but it never materialized. Instead, the largest addition during Hershend's tenure was the Blast Off Drop Tower. In 2015, Premier Parks took over Darien Lake. In 2016, EPR Properties purchased the entire property, but the park continued to be leased and operated by Premier. Then 2018, Six Flags once again acquired Darien Lake, and in 2019, the name was reverted back to Six Flags Darien Lake. Time will tell how long Six Flags will lease and operate the park. But this resort has so much potential. The entire property spans 1,200 acres. That is nearly three times the size of Cedar Point. The park itself is nearly 100 acres in size. Land is not an issue for Darien Lake. And the whole complex is really well built up. I already mentioned the concert venue, but there's plenty else. You have all these walking trails by the lakes. Then you have lodging galore. You have 1,000 site campground and a 160 room 3 star hotel named Lodge on the Lake. But the park doesn't have the same population base as the chain's other properties. The park is located in Corfu, New York, which has a population of just 700 people. The surrounding towns are similarly small too. The park's biggest attendance draws are locals from Buffalo and Rochester, which are just under an hour away. The big gold mine the park really needs to tap into are tourists visiting the nearby Niagara Falls. I can't really recall seeing any ads for the park when I've stayed over there. Meanwhile, you will see commercials and brochures for marine land everywhere, regardless of which side you're visiting. And to put it bluntly, Darien Lake is a far more complete amusement park. And it's a pretty good deal too. Six Flags has changed their pricing structures more often than Russell Westbrook has changed teams in recent years. As of this recording, daily admission costs $40 if you buy in advance online. I have no clue what they currently charge at the gate, but I'm guessing it's more than that. Then you also have to pay $20 to park. Alternatively, you can buy a season pass. These are being sold right now for a super low price of just $65. That's a steal, especially because it includes parking. This park makes a nice first impression. Ride of Steel's first drop in Camelbacks run alongside the main road. Then the park's water park and several coasters are adjacent to the parking lot. Seeing a skyline like this always gets me hyped up for my day. And the park revitalized its main entrance to this colorful lodge a few years ago. But there are actually two additional entrances in the back of the park too. One by Boomerang, and another by Moto Coaster. These are extremely convenient for guests staying at the campground or lodge. 
but any guest is more than welcome to use them, and you probably will because the park's layout is sort of weird. There are so many dead ends at this park, specifically, the midways to several coasters. You access Ride of Steel by walking underneath Predator, and there's nothing else back there. No other rides, nor facilities. Then Mind Eraser is located at the end of a long pathway away from the main midway. But the most egregious dead ends of all are the ones by Boomerang and Moto Coaster. These two rides are physically near each other on the shore of Fun Lake. But to get between them from within the park, you need to walk all the way around Fun Lake. It is actually faster to use those back two entrances, exit the park by one, and re-enter using the other. It really baffles me why these two rides are not connected without leaving the park. It is strange to have two separate entrances so close to each other. It would make more sense if there was a pathway within the park connecting these rides, and then just one entrance for resort guests. Kuda Falls also used to be separated from the rest of the water park. You used to have to cross a bridge over the main midway to access this one slide tower. The placement reminded me of Hyena Falls at Holiday World. The slide closed after the 2014 season, and this plot sat vacant ever since. Viper's entrance and exit is another weird one. The entrance is off of the main midway beneath the ride's first drop. You then have to walk this long windy path to reach the station, which is on the easternmost edge of the property. The exit then dumps you off near the station in the back of Rowdy's Ridge, nowhere near the ride's main entrance. If Rowdy's Ridge is closed for staffing, which can happen at the start and end of the season, Viper will use an alternate exit that will dump you off by the lake. This makes it pretty annoying to re-ride this coaster. But how does the park look? This is a mixed bag. Let's start with the good. I love how rides are built up right against the lakes. It looks great off-ride and enhances the on-ride experience too. Then the newer attractions look good. These ones have fresh coats of paint and the park's buildings look good too. Some have traditional architecture, while others give off a woodsy or lodge vibe. On to the bad. This park has closed quite a few rides in recent years. Some of these were outright removed, causing some pathways to feel awkwardly open and empty. Others are just standing but not operating, just withering away like the Grizzly Run River Rapids ride. Not helping the overall atmosphere is the lackadaisical attitude of many employees. Some of them are good. The ones working Ride of Steel and Predator were super friendly last year. But most seem like they did not want to be there. Now let's talk about the operations. A lot of Six Flags parks ban loose articles from being stored on the ride platform for the major coasters. The only coaster with this policy at Darien Lake is Ride of Steel. At that ride, you can either place your bag in a paid locker, or they offer unsupervised cubbies adjacent to the main entrance. Now the speed at which employees check restraints is fine. The biggest issue with this park is that nearly every single coaster has just one train. The only coaster that ever runs two is the Gerslauer Eurofighter that has just eight person cars. This means the coaster lines will not move very fast. I have seen many coaster lines hover around the 20-30 to 30 minute mark on a quiet day. I have seen the line for Ride of Steel back up to about 45 minutes even on a super quiet day. So I can imagine this place is miserable on a busy weekend. So what are my tips for avoiding long lines? If you arrive at opening, I would head to Ride of Steel first. This is the park's most popular ride, and it's one you'll likely want to ride a few times. You can usually get a few rides before lines form. The best way to avoid crowds altogether is to visit on a rainy day. This is always a gamble with US parks. Some will close major rides in inclement weather. Then many parks will close early, citing low attendance. I visited this park on a very rainy day expecting the worst last year. But the park amazingly remained open as scheduled, and rides only closed for a half hour stretch when there was a nearby lightning strike. If you do encounter long lines, the park does have the flash pass skip the line system. You can either purchase an unlimited option or single shots. If you use the flash pass, just note you likely will not get a choice of seat. Most rides will route you up the exit, and you're placed in a random row at the discretion of the employees, typically towards the middle. With all that out of the way, let's delve into the ride lineup. For all of this park's warts, I actually like its attractions. The park currently has 8 different roller coasters. The lineup skews more towards thrills, which is right up my wheelhouse. The best of the bunch is Ride of Steel. This was the prototype Intamin Hyper Coaster. The layout has some dead spots between the large helixes and straight track, but it at least has an interesting setting over the water, and the ride's best moments are incredible. Every single hill has powerful ejector airtime. 
I particularly love the intensity of the final few hills and the sustained negative Gs on the third hill. See my review for more, but this is a worthy headlining attraction. The park's lone wooden coaster is Predator. This din creation has a really negative reputation in the coaster community, but I genuinely like this coaster, as long as you avoid a wheel seat. I specifically recommend waiting however long necessary for the very front row. There, this is a shockingly good ride. The first two thirds of strong airtime pops, and it's usually paired with laterals because most hills turn at the apex. The finale does fizzle out, but I think this ride gets way too much hate. Check out my review for my in-depth thoughts. The park's newest coaster is Tantrum. This was a Gerslauer Eurofighter ad right before Six Flags reacquired the park. It is a clone of Iron Shark, and the layout does a lot in a small footprint. The beyond vertical drop is strong ejector airtime. Then you have a series of disorienting maneuvers mixing in some hang time, air time, and positive Gs. And this all occurs with ultra freeing lap bars. This is yet another coaster of a separate review for if you want to learn more. Viper is the park's oldest major coaster, and it's still one of their more popular rides. This Aero Multi Looper may have some shaky parts, but the ride has its moments. The first drop delivers a potent pop of airtime, then all five inversions deliver. The first three of crushing positive G's, then the final two corkscrews offer some hang time because you navigate them with so little speed. I know some enthusiasts rank this ride higher than me, but as I said in my review, I appreciate this ride's history. One ride I cannot appreciate is Mind Eraser. This is a wretched Vacom SLC. While I will admit this inverted coaster is an action-packed layout, it is horrifically rough. You will be subjected to non-stop headbanging between the poor track work and bulky over-the-shoulder restraints. Boomerang is another heavily cloned coaster from Vacoma, but this one is tolerable. This one doesn't have too much headbanging, so it's easier to appreciate the punchy initial drop and the three forceful inversions going both forwards and backwards. The final major coaster is Moto Coaster. This was Zimperla's prototype motorbike coaster, and it's a really solid ride. The launch has some genuine force to it, then the layout, while repetitive, has some quick dips and fun turns thanks to the novel seating position. The last coaster is Hoot and Holler. This is a Zier Kitty coaster exclusively for kids, so this is one credit I will never be able to get. On that note, let's talk about this park's kids' areas. First is Beaver Brothers Bay. This was the former Looney Tunes area, and I think it looks really nice. It has a lot of greenery, and a half dozen rides exclusively for kids. Then you have Rowdy's Ridge. This has some rides exclusively for kids, and others that can comfortably accommodate adults as well. The most notable ride over here is easily Moose on the Loose. This ride is a masterpiece. It is a track-guided ride where you sit on a moose that bobs back and forth, and there's goofy narration start to finish that 100% makes the experience. This ride needs to be experienced to be believed. Moving on to the adult flat rides, Darien Lake has removed a lot of notable ones in recent years. This includes a lot of the classic Hust Thrill rides. I used to love the Ranger inverting swinging ship and the Twister Top Spin. Then the park lost their best observation ride in the 16-story tall giant wheel. But they still have a formidable lineup. You still have some older spinning rides. Then the park has invested in some newer flats as well. There are three I want to highlight. First is Sky Screamer. This is the park's tallest ride, standing 24 stories tall. This Funtime Starflyer offers a great view of the park and surrounding lakes, and this one is a good cycle too in terms of duration and rotational speed. Second is Blast Off. This is a 185 foot or 56 meter tall SNS space shot. The launch and airtime are as strong as some installations, but you still get a sweet view at the top. Third is Rolling Thunder. While the park lost Ranger, this Larson Superloop has the same strengths. You get oodles of hang time as you stall out or slowly invert. The park has also lost their best two water rides in recent years. The park used to have a really good log flume named Thunder Rapids. The final drop was particularly tall for the genre. Then you had a solid River Rapids ride in Grizzly Run. It went through the woods, and you were guaranteed to get soaked thanks to the unavoidable waterfalls. The one remaining water ride is Shipwreck Falls. It's a standard Intamin shoot the shoots. The drop is zippy, and then you're doused by a massive wave, but I prefer the other two water rides. Your best option for water rides now is the attached Hurricane Harbor Water Park. You have a well-rounded slide lineup. 
brain drains a thrilling trapdoor slide, then you have a mix of different tube slides to satisfy all tastes. One thing I have not been able to see is the park's laser light show. I have heard it's a really cool nighttime spectacular over the lake with lights and music, but I've never been at the park on a day when they've stayed open past sunset. Another thing that should not be missed is the park's fascination parlor. Most parks have removed these, so I'm stunned you can still find one at a large chain park like this. I'm worried it may not have much time left, but it is such an addicting game. It is a cross between skee-ball and tic-tac-toe, and it is a rare, reasonably priced midway game too. Moving on to the food, Darien Lake doesn't have as many venues accepting the meal plan as other Six Flags parks. The food quality is pretty typical for Six Flags though, but there is an anchor bar location. This was the restaurant that invented the buffalo wing. If you don't have a meal plan, know the food is extremely pricey for what you're going to get. I did have a weird food experience here last year though. I used one of my meals on chicken and fries. The chicken was fine, but the fries were cold and tasteless. As I went to throw them out, an employee working a midway game ran over and asked if they could have them. I was honestly surprised a Six Flags employee would be allowed to do that. So do I recommend Six Flags Darien Lake? Yes I do. While it is one of the weaker Six Flags parks, it is still an enjoyable park. Parts of the park look nice, and there are some notable rides too. Ride of Steel alone makes the park worth visiting, but you also have some good supporting coasters like Predator, Tantrum, and Viper. Then the non-coasters aren't too shabby either, and you have a really good water park included as well. The three areas this park can improve upon are the appearance in some areas, the employee friendliness, and the subpar operations. Now how much time should you spend here? I would suggest a full day if it's your first time. This gives you ample time to ride all the coasters if the park is busy, and you'll definitely want to stay until closing if you spend time in the water park and or want to see the laser light show. The nearby Seabreeze Amusement Park may be the best park in the area for families, but Six Flags Darien Lake is definitely your top option for thrills in the upstate New York area. Well, unless you want to cross the border and drive past Toronto to get to Canada's Wonderland. So those are my thoughts about Six Flags Darien Lake, upstate New York's Six Flags Park. What are your thoughts about this park, whether it be the constant changes in ownership, the rides, or anything else I talked about? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you considered subscribing, because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.